Subtle as a cockroach crawling across a white rug, it's the Digi Guys. Back into the left, it's Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. Oh, another fine listener supplied intro. Corey, which one of our fine longtime listeners sent that? That was sent in by Lorenzo Rafa. The end. Beautiful. Thank you, Lorenzo. And thank you, Corey. Uh, so, uh, Mark, I have been uh, without Colcoa and without Film Week and without uh, 10 visitors cluttering our house from uh, spring break. I uh, have had a little bit of time, so uh, got a lot of documentaries to uh, to burn through this week. How you doing? Huh? How you doing? I'm blowing my nose. Ah, oh, good man. Thanks for sharing. But first, and we don't really have a, a whole lot of new movies this week, but we do have. Uh, we should start off with the one, and I know that you are a big, big fan of this franchise, and I know you are super happy that this is out in 4K Ultra HD. Before we ma- we we shouldn't waste any time. We need to let you just get your emotions straight and and express. Just let it all hang out. Let I, it all hang out. I remember when Fifty Shades of Grey came out. I remember the screening. Because <laughs> the screening in you Hollywood. Realize I have I, I, I can't I can't watch either of these films beginning to end. I can't. They're they're both horrible. But the screening for the first one, you know, normally you know all media's are pretty state yeah. affairs. You're sit and watch the movie and you read a book before the movie starts or you check your Kindle or you yep. look at your phone and then the movie starts, you all go home. This one, every row mm-hmm. included at least one gaggle of three or four women dressed up and giggling already, thinking that they were going to see this this dangerous little fun little moment of girl bonding. Yeah. Right? Oh, let's go see Fifty Shades of Grey. It'll be so much fun. And of course, the movie was terrible. I just don't. And it, it was it, the movie was so it was so chaste. It was somehow they built it up to be this this sexy thing, this R rated sexy thing. It literally is what I, it, it's a Harlequin romance. It's it's terrible. You know, it was I, I it was read, the least sexiest film ever. I read one paragraph that somebody posted on Facebook at some point from the book. It was it wasn't even bad writing. It was illiterate writing. It was like the kind of writing I, – I, I, fourth graders write better than this. It was astonishing. I don't even know how this thing got published. Well, I, I believe it was self-published. Was, was it published on Amazon or something? Or? I don't know. I but don't you know, know what? But here, I'll, I'll tell you this. It's horrendous. I'll tell you this, though. That's good producing because you read that and you thought even though this is garbage writing, yeah. I think there's something in this. I can tap into well, something. I could say the same thing about Forrest Gump. Have you ever tried to read Forrest Gump, the, the novel? It's unreadable. Now, it's not unreadable because it's badly written. It's unreadable because the whole thing is written in his voice, from his point of view, in that bizarre, quirky pigeon English. And it just it's, it, it, it makes your brain cramp to try to read even a, a, a single sentence. I, so I don't know how anybody got through Forrest Gump and said, you know, this wouldn't just make a good movie. This would make... An Academy Award winning Robert Zemeckis directed Tom Hanks movie. I don't know how you get from point A to point B with with that, with with what you read. So I I do tip my hat to the producing in all these cases to be able to see that. That's true. That's what producing is. So anyway, uh, Fifty Shades Darker is the sequel. They uh, they dumped the original director, but the problem is that even though you bring in James Foley, who directed you know Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and uh, I believe At Close Range, and is a good director, at this point, you know the previous director already set the tone. You can't go back. I know. I mean, the, the, that's you it. Know, you establish the language, the visual language like of the some, series. It's like you just got a job directing, uh, you know, the uh, Big Bang Theory. You can't take them out on the street and and make like a, a new. You can't do it. You're you're there, and the show style and its uh, its whole deal, and you do a three camera deal. Yeah, you can't reinvent the wheel if the wheel's been there for, you know, an, a huge audience already. You, you can't I mean, this thing, it, it's, it's just, 
it's just watered down. Yeah. It's like it's it's like small little. Uh, it's like uh, it's not S and M. It's like it's like a lowercase s and lowercase m. It's not. It's the same as the other one. It's just not even remotely sexy. You know, I guess it feeds into this female fantasy of trying to change a guy and make him better. You yeah. know the. The mysterious, you know, gray. What's his deal? And she tries to kind of infiltrate his life and, and you know, and make him a better person. I guess there's a certain fantasy in that, because a sexual fantasy doesn't really do anything unless you're literally the most, you know, chaste, G-rated, Amish person. Yeah. yeah. The sex in here means nothing. It's nothing. You can go online and get something. You, you see stuff like that on the CW. <laughs> you know. And the thing is, it's not even it's so bad that it's good. If 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 the films just said you know what this thing sucks well let's just own it like almost like a, a almost like a sexual expendables film yeah well like we know this is bad <laughs> let's just own it and just just go nuts that'd be fine but go these, with it. They, these things they 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 think they're real they they, they think this is a real movie uh, this is a real story to be told it's terrible so yeah. anyway the Blu-ray's got a bunch of bonus features on it the uh, Ultra 4K is fine it's very glossy very glossily shot. Um, and if you think you're going to see some like hot smoking sex in 4K, yeah. this is not your movie. Even though it's rated R, and even though it's a little bit, it's a little bit um, more R-rated than the previous one. It's really not much. So I, this thing is just terrible. And then uh, we got a little indie this week, which I've got to make mention of because this thing's so unhinged. Uh, it's called the Greasy Strangler. How's that for a title, The Greasy Strangler? I like it. Uh, this is one of those offbeat, weird, little, quirky, low-budget L.A. movies where some people had a camera, and they may have had a permit, but they probably didn't, and they had uh, some time to roam around L.A. and just in wax weird. And that's what this is. This is a guy and his son who do this walking tour of disco in Los Angeles, and they wind up fighting over uh, a woman who takes their tour, and meanwhile, there's this uh, creepy kind of monster, maniac, serial killery thing <laughs> called the Greasy Strangler roaming around. It's Look, it's just weird. It's shot in L.A. in a very strange way, and uh, it, there are millions of these movies out there, but this is one that is just so completely unhinged. They just they don't even pull their punches. They just say, let's just... This is never going to find an audience, so why even bother? And as a result, it may find an audience. Uh, a few foreign language films real quickly before we uh, dive into some television. Uh, we've got the from Icarus Films, Chef's Wife, which I'm going to recommend just because it has Car uh, Karen Villar and Emmanuel Devos, who are just wonderful French actresses, and apparently have never made a film together. I find that hard to believe, but uh, anyway... It's just one. This is a wonderful, wonderful uh, general French drama where you know you you just. Uh, it's not even about the plot. It's about watching these two wonderful actresses and their particular life problems. There are certain family problems with their husband, and you know, it it you just. It's wonderful. It's just really wonderful. It's a wonderful clinic and acting. The nice thing about this too is it's directed by Anne Lenny, uh, who used to be an actress and is now a director. So uh, check that out. That's from the Strib Films. And it's called The Chef's Wife, uh, directed by Anne Lenny with uh, Karen Villar and Emmanuel Devos, and also a sporting performance by Roche Dizem, who I always enjoy. Um, and then we have a thing here called Elena, which is based on a graphic novel that I've obviously never heard of because there are just too many graphic novels out there. Uh, this is not superhero stuff. This is not really uh, comic book stuff. This is a... Uh, this is kind of a teen horror thing, and it's it's it it, it gets into the whole prep school, private school uh, as a prison metaphor. And um, in this case, it is specifically about this girl named Elena who has been just you know horribly tormented by the rich girls at this private school, and uh, then it gets kind of a little supernatural and weird. Uh, and I I, I won't. Uh, I won't tell you exactly how it uh, how it goes on, but anyway, it uh, it's it's chilling and it's well done and um, probably I'm trying to think if it's it's a you know it feels a little bit Mike at a certain point. And then uh, from Film Movement, we got a uh, an interesting little movie here called um, Apprentice by Bu Jun Fung. This is uh, from Film Movement. This was at the uh, in the certain regards section at the Cannes Film Festival, I think about a year ago. 
Uh, Cannes, Cannes is starting very soon. I know. Yeah. Exciting stuff. Uh, yeah. Uh, my, my, uh, my girlfriend's going for a week. Uh, oh, yeah. She's got a free place to stay. Oh, nice. Free office to use. Terrific. You got hooked up. Anyway, the uh, so the uh, this is about a um, this is all it takes place in the uh, in in the correctional world of Malaysia, and uh, I think I'm supposed to say Malay, not Malaysian. But uh, anyway, um, very interesting commentary on this by the director, which is really worth listening to. And then there's a cool short film that's uh, that's Singaporean here. But the uh, the the world of capital punishment in Malaysia is not like it is here. I mean, they still hang people. And they have apprentices to the hangman, and it it feels very medieval, and uh, it it actually kind of is. And there's a this is this to sort of get inside that world in a very chilling psychological way. It, this film really deserves some kudos. So um, this is a crazy co-production between Singapore and France and Hong Kong and Qatar and Germany, and I don't know how they put all the money together, but there just isn't money in Malaysia to actually make Malaysian films. So somehow they were able to cull money together from all these different countries in Europe and Asia and even the Middle East, and uh, they made this film. And Bu Jun Fung, good for him. He, he got it into a certain regard. Uh, so it's uh, quite provocative and, and very disturbing. And then we got a really cool box set from Arrow, and we got some other Arrow stuff again to talk about later. Last week we talked about the uh, the Donnie Darko box set. This actually rivals it, believe it or not. What? It's not one film, uh, it, but it's it's you know many films. And this is, if you're not familiar with Kiju Yoshida, as I was not, um, uh, Yoshida is uh, a, a, a a quite an interesting Japanese director. Uh, a contemporary of uh, Nagisa Oshima and a lot of those other kind of late stage Japanese new wave directors, and um, it's he really has a it's a fascinating style the way he makes his movies. The box set is called Love Plus Anarchism, and uh, includes films like uh, Eros Plus Massacre and Heroic Purgator- Purgatory. And uh, movies that I had never heard of, never seen before. I can't say that I, I, these are movies that I want to watch a lot, but I, I, he's a really aggressive stylist and um, really somebody who's worth discovering because he just didn't, he's not, he was never on my uh, radar with any of the, the great uh, new wave directors of, uh, of the period. And uh, so, anyway, it, this is an interesting box set for those who may want to see his stuff, or discover his stuff. It's, uh, it's all on Blu ray. From Arrow, from the Arrow Academy line. Let's say that. Let's be very clear about that. The Arrow Academy line. Um, maybe the most interesting film here actually is called Coup d'etat. In any case, uh, the filmmaker is Kiju Yoshida, Love Plus Anarchism box set from Arrow Academy. Um, I applaud them because I don't, you know, they, you have to kind of work hard to develop an audience for this. So I hope this, uh, I hope this finds an audience. All right, let's talk about some TV, Mark. Okay, let's do that. Um... It's all acorn stuff. You love this crap. I no, it's just this one. This, this one, Rake. This is Rake, series one. Okay. Yeah, that's the that's the only acorn thing here. Um, the uh, Rake, series one, with the great Richard Roxburgh, who just doesn't age. Um, I don't know what his game is, but he continues to be absolutely amazing. Uh, this is an Australian comedy. Kind of a drama. Kind of a comedy. It's also got Hugo Weaving in it uh, and uh, the absolutely wonderful and fantastic um, Rachel Griffiths. Uh, I, you know, look, I... Oh, and by the way, Rachel Ward uh, is one of the directors on this. Isn't that interesting? Rachel Ward? Yeah. Well, that's Rachel Ward and Peter, Peter Duncan. I mean, it's, anyway, it's a good show. Rake, Series 1. It's, uh, it's, it's, like, the, it's like all those uh, British barrister shows. You know, it's a, it's a courtroom thing. It's a, it's a legal thing, but it's not like the American legal thing. It's more like, uh, I guess it's like an Australian Ally McBeal by way of, uh, oh, what's that British series that has the, uh, with the barrister? Only Horses and Beer. That's the one, exactly. Wait, it That's called? exactly it. I don't know. It's, it's one of those things. It's got some title like that. Anyway, uh, check it out. Sam Neill, a, a lot of great talent here. Uh, Noah Taylor looks kind of weird in this thing. But uh, Rake, Series 1, good. Uh, it's it's Ally McBeal-ish. That's all I can tell you. It's Ally McBealish with uh, Australian accents. 
Uh, wait, there's an HBO show called Divorce with uh, Sarah Jessica Parker and uh, Hayden Church. Oh, I, I heard about this. I well, the, the, this was supposed to be, you know, the uh, or you know, e- easily billed as the flip side to Sex and the City, right? Yeah. So you've got this uh, this woman played by uh, uh, Parker who decides subtly that she wants to end her ten year marriage to uh, Thomas Hayden Church, but uh, you know it can be difficult to suddenly decide you want to get divorced and start start anew. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you know there's obviously a lot of truth here. Um, there's some laugh out loud stuff, but I think ultimately this not really gonna grab the zeitgeist the way that Sex in the City did. You know? Yeah. Um, so this thing is kind of just, uh, it's kind of just. Lies there? Yeah, it's just kind of scuffing along. All right. Uh, we've got some what, three minor titles here I'll make mention of real quickly. Shark Week, Shark and Awe Collection. This is a Walmart exclusive, Mark. What? You can't get this anywhere else. If you want Shark Week, Shark and Awe, you got to go to Walmart. I know. You're going to be driving all over the city looking desperately to see I where, 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 how, where, I who. am. Uh, this is uh, 32 episodes of Shark Week. I have never understood why this is a thing, but I guess... Because it's awesome. I guess. It's, it's sharks. Sh- it's weeks. Whatever. Uh, anyway, that's from Discovery. And then we've, uh, we also have Bob Hope Salutes the Troops. This is three DVDs featuring Bob Hope doing uh, USO performances. Uh, some of it better than others. Some of it is not really that interesting. It's more interesting to see who he brings out. Uh, than any, I mean, like, you know, Pointer Sisters are in this. Which is kind of unexpected. Um, Angelian, I'd forgotten Angelian was even a thing. Remember Angelian? Yeah. My goodness. Anyway, you know, yeah, you gotta... know watching this is like watching those old Friars Club roasts. It is exactly. Like they, they, they bring up these names from the seventies that like you vaguely it's remember a blast as from the, the tiniest past. kid. It's a blast from the past. Um, so it's it's more kitsch than anything else. You know, Bob Hope and USO and a lot of a lot of uh, Rosie Greer is in this as well. So that's uh, that's fun. But three DVDs is a lot. You're not going to sit there and watch all three DVDs of this thing. You put the you put it on in the back background during a party. And then as long as we're talking about Shark Week, uh, we have another Walmart exclusive. Mark Beaches. Oh no no no! I know you're thinking Beaches, the Gary Marshall movie with uh, Bette Midler and Barbara Hershey. No no no! You wish. No, this is the new television version with Nia Long and Idina Menzel. Did I say Idina Menzel? I'm sorry. I meant Madame Dum Yeah, wait, what did he say? <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. It was, the, it was just the, the greatest moment in Academy Awards history. And now to sing the Oscar nominated song from Frozen in Dim Blims to Dumbledum. <laughs> Let's make a look that up real quick. <laughs> Engelbert Humperdinck. It's hysterical. I don't know why. This was a Lifetime production, uh, and it's not very good. And it makes me sad to say that because it's directed by Alison Anders, who is so monumentally talented. Monumentally talented, or they're calling Do we need to hear that again? What did he say? Wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Don't stop the recording. I'm not. Adele Dazim, ladies and gentlemen. Adele Dazim. Adele Dazim. How do you get Adele Dazim out of that? Adina Menza. I don't even understand. He might as well have just said Christopher Walken. It would have been easier. I don't. <sighs> anyway, so this is a lifetime production of Beaches. It's a remake. I love. Look, get me. Don't get me wrong. I think Adina Menzel is great. I think Neil Long is great. Um. Mary Agnes Donahue, who wrote the original script, is great, and uh, you know that's the basis of this more so than the novel. Uh, I I think Alison Anders is amazing. I love Alison Anders. Uh, she, you know, Grace of My Heart should have been nominated for tons of Oscars, and she should have been nominated for Best Director. She is now sentenced to making TV movies, and it is so tragic to me. But this doesn't work. It just doesn't work, and I and I, I wish it did. I really wish it did, but it doesn't. Anyway, um, wait. The orange is the new black. Yeah. You know, just when it, season four, just when it looked like the show was about to become kind of slip into kind of autopilot, and maybe yeah. had just have a slow descent into cancellation. Yeah. This uh, season's good. It's a good season. It's a dark show. A pretty brave show, you know. They do a lot of stuff about uh, you know racism and yeah. economic disparity. There's definitely room for that kind of stuff, along with kind of the crazy, you know, humor. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, this thing's better than ever. Season four, Orange is the New Black. It's on uh, Blu-ray. And uh, there's a gag reel, set tour, some commentary. So if you like the show and you're a collector, I would definitely check out uh, Orange is the New Black. Season quatre. Quatre. There you go. You're getting your French on. Damn right. Good man. Animal Kingdom, complete first season. Uh, this is a TNT series based on the amazing movie, uh, which we all love. We love Animal Kingdom, the movie. And uh, they went and actually somehow looked at that movie and said, you know, even though there's closure in that movie, I mean, you, I don't know how you sort of look at that movie and think, let's, use, let's make this into a series. Um, but they did. And uh, it's, it, um, I want to say it, it kind of works. It's on its way to working. I mean, it's no longer set in Australia. It's now set in Southern California. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the same general premise. You got, you know, 17-year-old kid. His mom dies of an overdose. And so he goes, you know, now he gets moves in with his evil crime lord grandmother and the, all the horrible relatives. And it's much more rednecky than it is outbacky. Uh, it, it's, you know, so it, you, you can tell that they've sort of adapted the structure. Um, I'd, I'd rather watch the movie again. Yeah, I would too. But that said, I mean, it'll be interesting to see where they take this. It's it shows promise. It's kind of it's got some growing pains. It's kind of trying to sort of figure out where it's going to go. But you can when you watch it, you can sort of see that, that where they're what they're aiming for. And Ellen Barkin as the the uh, the matriarch of this clan is very very good. It's a very different take on the character uh, as you would expect it to be. But uh, you know, I mean, I'm gonna. I'll give them room to grow. It's uh, it's the first season. It's a little it's a little awkward, but you know TNT takes chances on things, and uh, let's give them some time. And that's also uh, it's on Blu-ray with Ultraviolet. Uh, Wade, we have on um, DVD the Forty Four Hundred, the complete series. This is that show that uh, kind of muddled along for four seasons. It's about this uh, this comet that comes to Earth, and when it uh, when it arrives, 4,400 people go missing, and then they come back, and some have been missing for years, and some have been missing for months, and who are these people, and why can't they remember where they were? Why can't they remember where they went? And so, um, yeah, so that's what it's about. So there's literally 4,400 stories they could have told during the course of this series, but um, it's got Peter Coyote in it, and we always like to see him. He, of course, from uh, E.T., and, uh, yeah, this thing was pretty good. It kind of, uh, again, it, 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 like the other show, it kind of scuffled along a little bit. But um, 42 episodes on 10 discs, you've got to be a real, got to be a real 4,400 head to, uh, to check this out. But there's audio commentaries on some of the episodes, deleted scenes. So if you're a fan of the show, you know you got to get it. The 4,400, it, to me, it's not worth, I mean, uh, if you watch a handful of these episodes, you'll get it. You know, it, it doesn't have that. That you know Damon Lindelof, J.J. Yeah. J. Abrams thing, where it's yeah. constantly just intriguing you big time, and like a like a prime time Twilight Zone soap opera. It's not right. quite that polished, but uh, yeah, Four Seasons is not a bad run nowadays. All right, um, Mark, I'm going to burn through a whole lot of PBS right now. I uh, had PBS just sitting on the TV. Great, all, I'll all check week. the news. Yeah, so uh, here we go. This is what we got from PBS. It's a big, big chunk of big chunk of wonderful. Uh, on Blu-ray, the only Blu-ray of PBS is Yosemite, which is an installment of Nature that uh, just demands to be on Blu-ray. It's, it's gorgeous. Yosemite. I'm sure it is. This is gorgeous. If you've never been to Yosemite, you will feel as if you have just from watching this. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Great. Uh, just put you don't even put the put the sound down. This doesn't even have to have the sound on. Uh, Yosemite is so gorgeous. I am ashamed to admit, even though it's relatively close, I've never been there. And uh, but I've seen all of the you know the Ansel Adams photographs, so this this definitely complements all that. It is gorgeous, just wonderful. Uh, it's an hour long. It should be twice as long. It could be three times as long. You'd still have a great time. And uh, if you turn up the sound, it's beautiful. Five point one. It's great. Uh, Yosemite, one of the great treasures of America. And then on Blu-ray, we've got four here, four PBS documentaries that deal with. Issues of current political import. Uh, we have the the first two are both front lines, and uh, one is Divided States of America, which talks about uh, kind of goes back into the Obama administration and and uh, comes up into the early stages of the Trump administration and talks about just how divided the country is and why and the media and populism and it's a it's a you know typically awesome front line. And then the other front line, which complements it, is Trump's road to the White House. I know you love that picture. There he is wearing his make-a-make-a-great hat and with the gesture and the whole thing. 
By the way, the the idea of of doing a rally to to compete with the correspondence dinner, kind of an interesting thing. But the, but but he but he he's all about misdirect. I know that's that's, it, that's what it is. I know. You know it's just every every week is a you know I've sort of stopped paying attention because it's just all too. Like I just I know people who love Trump and I know people who hate Trump and I I I want to continue to have dinner with all my friends so I just I just don't even broach the subject anymore. Um, but this is really interesting. Trump's road to the White House. It is uh, it is extremely you know these are the people who do the uh, the choice documentaries that they do every four years and this is uh, this is really really incredibly insightful and uh, it it gets into a lot of the uh, kind of gets into the weeds in ways that no other media outlets have, and that's what Frontline does so well. So I, uh, I do recommend that. I also recommend The Talk, Race in America. Uh, this is a standalone doc from WNET13, who does all kinds of great work for PBS. And, uh, you know, it, this has been a subject in America for a half a century now, if not longer, uh, ever since the Civil Rights era and certainly substantially before that. Um, and it is really, really interesting, and they they put a lot of voices in this, and uh, it doesn't come to any conclusions, but it certainly contributes to the conversation, as does John Lewis Get in the Way, which is a profile of the great civil rights legend John Lewis, who is still in Congress, and uh, who was one of the seminal figures in the civil rights movement, and who has become somewhat controversial uh, since. Some people accuse him of being becoming more of a mainstream establishment politician, than a, uh, a conscientious activist. They, some people say his time has come and gone. So others say he's still holding up his legacy. All of that is covered here. Uh, and there are interviews here that, that I have never seen before, you know, that go back decades. So it's really, really interesting. And then the rest of the PBS stuff. We've got The Great British Baking Show. You ever seen that, Mark? I have not, but three, I'm intrigued. Three seasons. Three seasons. Three seasons. I, I, you, do you want these? Because you can make these, and I want you to make them for me. Well, not all of them. Oh, my gosh. Macaroni, there is some, the macarons here, there, those are very delicate. There are great desserts and all kinds of fun things there. You know what? Uh, uh, maybe if they had a book. <laughs> maybe I'll just get the book. <laughs> Let me see this. I'm going to check right now. Maybe there's a great, what's it called? Great British Great baking. British Baking Show. Show. The British, the British oh. have the best cooking shows. They really do. The best, the, just simply the best. Um, I am not a baker. I can cook. As they say, cooking is art and baking is chemistry. And uh, I, I, I was never good at chemistry. I, you have to get everything just right. It can't just be a, a dash and a pinch. It has to be precise. Yes, it does. It's like super precise. Everything has to be absolutely spot on. And the, and the minutes, you can't just say, well, put it into, you know, four, set it to around 400, 425, leave it in for, you know, 10 or 12 minutes until the thing browns. No, you can't. You can't do that. Because co- it's you know, like, be spot on. Because cooking is all about hiding your mistakes. Yes. Like you cook, you're like, uh, this is not salt. You know, I'm going to throw some salt in. And then, <laughs> you know, and then, oh, this is delicious. Of course, you saved it at the last minute by throwing some salt in. Can't do that with baking. No. Baking is unforgettable. Giving. That's true. If you make the slightest mistake, it screws up. So anyway, that's why I just I love watching these. It's really it's a lot of fun, but it's so intimidating, so intimidating. I mean, you know, especially like tarts. I never realized how difficult tarts are to make. What about t- what the, the the crust or just no? Just the, the whole thing because because it, like tarts are really it's like I, with a cake you're like oh well we you can't mess it or it'll fall. Everyone's always afraid that the cake will fall that it has to rise. And tarts, oh, well, a tart, you know. No, tart, you have to, like, it, it, if it cooks just wrong, things have to marry, right? They have to marry. That's the, the cooking that, Well, you know what? That's word. why, like, um, uh, oh, what is it called? Schmutzy. <laughs> Ice cream. Eggs. No, it's, uh, oh, you know what? I think I'm getting, I Cleveland. Think I'm, I think I'm getting sick. Cleveland. I, I think I'm getting Alzheimer's. I can't remember where, I can't remember things anymore. I know, I can't either. I really can't. I can't either. It's a custardy thing. I'm so sorry, Fred. It's a <laughs> see that. See what I did? See what I did there? It's a custardy thing. Yeah. Uh, creme brulee. Creme brulee. Okay. Now with creme brulee, <laughs> you know, if if if, if the creme brulee is not going to come together, yeah, I could literally keep the creme brulee in the oven for 17 hours, and it mm-hmm. will not come together. It will not. It will not congeal. Okay. And it's annoying, and I don't know how to stop it. So yes, sometimes when you bake, if you mess it up, you cannot fix it. It's too bad. All right, so we got some Nova here, too. Uh, three interesting Novas. 
uh, in particular, Super Tunnel, which is uh, the cross rail. It's about building the cross rail, which is this enormous tunnel project uh, that's going underneath London, and it's just it it it's ridiculously expensive, and it's it's an insane piece of engineering. And uh, it, it I didn't even know this was a thing, but it's really it, it it's quite a monument to uh, to British engineering. I gotta say that. Uh, Treasures of the Earth, Power, Gems, and Metals. Uh, this gets into, you know, what it obviously is all about, which is what's underneath the, the Earth, what's in the mountains, what are the things that we go and dig up and mine for and drill for that, uh, that sustain civilization. Uh, super, super interesting. Uh, there's also Search for the Super Battery. I really wish they would get on with it. Nothing bugs me more than battery power technology. It's just so deficient and backwards. And uh, this is talking about what's what's necessary for us to get to that breakthrough in in battery technology. I mean, we're still basically working with, you know, hundred year old battery technology. And there's there's going to be a breakthrough where you can get to a battery that doesn't lose power. No, no, that, planned obsolescence will never happen. But you know, you want it. You want a battery that doesn't lose power. Uh, over time, you know what I'm saying? Where, like, like most batteries today, you charge if it's rechargeable, even in a car, like your with your Never. Tesla, you'll get you'll get you know 300 miles on a charge, and then over time you'll eventually get to well like 250 miles on a charge, and by the time you're down to about 50 miles on a charge, you're really cursing, and now you have to spend you know 12 thousand dollars on a new battery. Never. Might as well buy a new car. Never happened. And so this is you know we want to get to the super battery, new technology that doesn't get deficient over time, will endlessly recharge. And will hold a charge for a very, very long period of time. I, I, you know what? They can make that tomorrow. You think? Of course. They need to. They need to. I need those batteries. <laughs> Duracell, get on that. Uh, let's hang on a second. I'm going to jump ahead here just for a moment. No, let me uh, hold on. The uh, Two more Novas I'm, I'm going to add to this. School of the Future. Uh, which is about uh, obviously education. How you uh, how you adapt uh, education for our changing world. Um, not a great Nova, but an interesting one if you have kids, and I I do, and uh, my daughter's going to start kindergarten next year, and I'm terrified about that. And then uh, this is kind of weird and lame, but somehow cute. The Origami Revolution. Um, I don't quite buy the premise of this thing, but uh, you know, if you like folding paper. Uh, this basically tells you that you are key to changing the world. That like origami is part of our new information revolution, and that origami is like ha- plays a part. I don't really buy it. Uh, you know the, the the whole idea that there's like this algorithm. It just it's it's a very it's a very peculiar premise, but I don't quite buy it. Anyway, Secrets of the Dead is another great series. Uh, Nero's Sunken City, Van Gogh's Ear, and Leonardo, The Man Who Saved Science, which is all about Leonardo da Vinci. All of them are really, really great. Um, Secrets of the Dead continues to be a really, really good show. Plants Behaving Badly, which is just about weird plants that do things that you that plants really shouldn't do, like, you know, shopping at Target. Really? Yeah, maybe. Uh, then Wild Weather. It should have been on Blu-ray. This is all about extreme weather conditions. A lot of great photography here. Would have been better on Blu-ray. Really, really uh, far-reaching stuff that they went, you know, tornadoes and uh, hurricanes and dust storms and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, And then the last two, uh, one is a front line, one is an American experience. These are both about, uh, you know, conflict in our time, one of them foreign and one of them domestic. Ruby Ridge is an American Experience documentary that is all about that 1992 catastrophe in August when the uh, the showdown at uh, Ruby Ridge happened. And uh, that changed a lot in American society. It changed a lot of laws. It changed the way that people deal with uh, with uh, barricaded fugitives and, and the like. Um, it is, uh, it's a very, very disturbing revisitation of a particular point in American history. By the way, you know what we didn't talk about uh, on last week's show? It's the 25th anniversary of the L.A. riots I this know. month. There's a great documentary on... Um... There are two. I talked about one of them on Film Week a uh, week ago, which is uh, L.A. 92. And then there's the John Ridley doc, which is also uh, around the same time, Let It Fall. And John Ridley's is mostly interviews and archival footage. And L.A. 92, 
uh, is all archival footage, and it's just gripping and riveting it, and really disturbing. Well, it's, it, that one sounds like it's uh, like the O.J. Simpson doc. It is. It's very much. It's a. It's kind of a partner film because it connects it to the Watts riots, which were from 1965, right? Uh, you know, so it's it's here. It's a generation separating these these almost identical incidents, and uh, it's very upsetting. It really is. You wonder, have we still learned nothing? Um, and you know, well, the, weird the, thing well the, the, the good news is we have a black president. We had a black president. The bad news is we've still learned nothing. Yeah. And, and the weird thing for watching LA-92 and the subject of the riots, for me, I wasn't even here. I was in Paris when the riots broke out. I was on my way to, to Cannes for the first time. And, uh, you know, I'd been cavorting around Paris. I was, I was staying with a friend in Paris for a few days, very sweet old lady, that, an old friend of a family's. And uh, I got back to her place, and uh, she said, oh, things are happening. And I was like, okay, what? Like, you know, like, what? There's like a, like it rained. What, what, what's happening in L.A.? And we turned the TV on, and I was like, oh, whoa. And then I remembered, oh, the trial. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I was like, "You got to be kidding me!" This, oh no! And uh, then I found out. I called my mother, who was very calm, and she just said, "Oh yeah, it's fine. We're we're okay. I'm watching some smoke." You guys are up on a hill in Malibu. Well, but she's are... she's she's watching the like. She says, "I'm looking in the distance. I see some smoke plumes." I'm like, "Okay, I, that doesn't make me feel better." But you know, she went. She lived through World War II. This is all. Oh yeah, I hear the Russian guns. I think I see some artillery. You know, it, it, none of it phases her. None of it phased her. Right. She was just. She was unimpeachable, uh, unflappable. That's the word, unflappable. How, w- it, was she the unsinkable Molly Brown? She was, uh, not Molly Brown, but you know, she was just generally unsinkable. Why have you not given me the cookies of life recipe yet? The cookies of life you recipe know, needs to be mine. Yes, um, I will dig that you, up today. You have promised me that. I know. For I got to dig up. I got to dig up the recipe. It's Wade's so mother much made the best. Through. Wade's mother made the. I remember. So Wade's mother made the best cookies. I used to call them the cookies of life. And whenever I would come over to Wade's place, Wade's mother would would take out. A, she loved it. She would take out a, a, a little uh, jar yeah. of these cookies and slam them down in front of my face and say, "Here." Yeah. And, and she knew that by the end, yeah. I, I would I would eat <laughs> five, six, seven, eight of them. I don't yeah. care. Yeah. They're great. They, she, she and loved. I, them. I want, she loved I, that. I want the cookies of life to live on through me, but you will not allow it. Yeah, well, I, I have to find it. I've got so much stuff packed up in the garage. You know, I still haven't gotten through it all. Anyway, uh, frontline documentary "Battle for Iraq," which also includes a little bit on hunting ISIS, uh, which is a a you know a, a secondary subsidiary piece to this, but it is it it's like half the you know half the running time. Um, obviously this gets into all of the stuff that is still front and center and none of it has changed, although things are changing, I guess, incrementally, but it has not changed to any substantial degree. It continues to be very, very much in our news, ISIS, Iraq, Afghanistan, all of that stuff. And, uh, this gets into, uh, this gets into the weeds and, uh, tries to sort of unravel why and, and who and what. It's, it's fairly all-encompassing, probably a little too short, but still very, very moving battle for Iraq from the front line. All right, that's it for these. Um, Mark, we can talk about some other docs, or we can go into anime, because I know there's one anime that you want to talk about. Am I supposed to be? Uh, oh my God, Wade! Thank you so much. Well, no, I just. I'm not gonna do it. Okay. Although I did very much love the Red Turtle. I thought you went crazy for this. Were you? Were you great. nuts for this? Okay. Though, d- did you not like it? Uh, I like it very much, but I think um, uh, the other one, the one we gave the award to, is a better film. Which one? Uh, uh, the uh, uh, oh gosh, one one my note life thing. What was it called? I can't remember. It the wasn't name. the zucchini thing. No, it wasn't the zucchini. It's and the it other anime. It's the other anime. It was it's your your name. Your name. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, your name. I don't know why I can't remember that title. Because I'm going you, totally senile. Because you're like me. We're, yeah. We're goddamn. Oh, your your name. Your name. Your name is uh, is a better film. I yes. think. But but is, this is still a really great film. You know what? I think this thing is just exquisite. It's um, there's no dialogue. All you've got is the sound of water and wind and birds. And a score, and that is it. And it's about uh, you get these very simple, beautifully rendered images of, your, of young of a young castaway living out his entire life on a desert island, and uh, it's just crazy. It's just really, really affecting. And the only other character in the film, basically, is this red turtle, and it's just lavish, and the imagery is stunning. And I just there's all sorts of uh, of interpretations you could possibly uh, make from this thing. 
So I just thought it was really just an interesting, fascinating, provocative sort of vessel for whatever you want the film to mean. So I loved it. The Red Turtle. Uh, the Red Turtle. It was uh, uh, nominated for an Oscar, Best Animated Film. Very deservedly too. Very deservedly too, yeah. and uh, we considered it very strongly, as Wade just said, for the Lafka Award. But we gave it to your name. Which is also very good. And you know, they sent they sent us a uh, a big old press kit announcing the uh, uh, the theatrical release of your name with the dubbed version. I mean, it's really glossy, like Funimation really really went to town. And right across the top of that big old fancy press kit, L.A. Film Critics, yay! They really they really they made a big big fuss out of it. Yeah, the um, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting anime that's finally kind of mainstreaming, and the Red Turtle is really just it's so it's so. All that studio, you know, it's a Ghibli or Ghibli. We always, I always say Ghibli because Ghibli sounds like giblets. I think I it like is that. Ghibli. It's we always, we always are, are we always get corrected by uh, Charles Solomon. No, 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 no. By uh, by our our Japanese listeners. Oh. We've got we've got a few, and they're always correcting. They're always sending. Yeah, I can't say Ghibli because it sounds like giblets, and giblets is a silly word. I think you're supposed to say Ghibli. It sounds. I know. Like it's hard. It doesn't <laughs> spill off the off the tongue. But in any case, Red Turtle, terrific movie, great movie. All right, uh, a few other anime things to uh, to plow through here. Ocean Waves is a uh, Tomomi Mo- Mochizuki Tomomi Mochizuki film. Uh, this is also Studio Ghibli, and it is really quite delightful. Like if John Hughes had made anime, this is probably what he would have done. Uh, something like this. It's a very simple uh, simple drama. Uh, about a couple of guys going back to school, and then there's a a, a transfer student from Tokyo who um, changes their lives, and uh, you know it, it's just where these relationships go, and uh, it's really it's very very uh, it's it's well written and beautifully animated and very sensitively made, and it's great, and it has a a, a short film about what it there's a short really cute short film here about uh, what it's like at Studio Ghibli, uh, which is Terrific. So um, that's great. Ocean Waves. Very sweet film. Really nice. And then much more kind of traditional anime. Uh, we got a mobile suit Gundam here. We got a bunch of Gundams. Uh, we've got uh, all this stuff out. So let me uh, try to. Okay, so here we go. So we've got uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. Uh, this is the eighth MS Team OVA series. Now, for those who've sometimes asked us, OVA means there's there are episodes here that are not that were never televised. They're only available on uh, uh, on uh, Blu-ray and DVD. So this is uh, this is twelve episodes of um, uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, the O eighth MS Team OVA series, and it also includes the uh, the movie Miller's Report. Uh, this is some of the more entertaining Gundam stuff. I don't make try to make sense of it anymore. I just watch the big robot suits just go haywire and blow things up and people fight and hair flails, and it's it's terrific. Uh, then we also have um, Turn of Gundam. This is, we got a couple of these, actually. Um, set one and two of um, the... Uh, uh, it's a, it's a different Gundam series. This is episodes 1 through 25 on one set, and then uh, 26 through 50 on the other. And uh, this is, you know, the the uh, V Gundam, uh, Turn of Gundam series, which is more the same. And then uh, Mobile Suit Gundam F91, which I'm, is is what I want to kind of wrap up with here on the uh, on the Gundam stuff, which is very different animation from the rest of the stuff. It's very interesting. It's very aggressive. It's more stylized. And it makes it more interesting, makes it all fresh. And this even has an English commentary track on it. So that is that is super, super cool. Uh, Mobile Suit Gundam F91, some of the most interesting anime and, uh, artwork that I've seen in a long time, especially on something like an established concept in an established universe. Now, the Mobile Suit, is it a, uh, is, is it a bespoke suit that is uh, tailored to you specifically? Do you wear a tie or a cravat or a bow tie with this suit? Uh, Can I wear it to weddings and bar mitzvahs? Ascot. You have to wear it with an ascot. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. And then let's see. Uh, let's. Well, here we go. Got another Pokemon. Um, we got Pokemon uh, Volcanian Mechanical Marvel. 
uh, Volcanion. Uh, this is Pokemon the movie, Volcanion and the Mechanical Marble. I did not watch a single solitary second of this, so I'm just going to make mention of it because I can't watch Pokemon anymore, really. I, it just it, it grates on me. Uh, but it, this is out there for all those Pokemon fans. And then from the same people, Viz, uh, I did watch Sailor Moon R, the movie, because I like Sailor Moon, because I love all these pixie girls with the long hair with, and, the, and the long legs and the short skirts, and they're all cute, and they have, you know, they're like, they're, they're like not quite, they're, they're otherworldly, and they're adorable, and they have big eyes, and I just like the animation, because I'm a sick human being. So Sailor Moon and the Sailor Guardians, uh, you know, are once again saving Earth, and uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun. Uh, everything Sailor Moon is is kind of uh, it's fetishisticy, but it's enjoyable in a very chaste way, and uh, I like that it splits that difference. And then uh, let me see, I'm gonna do last two last two animes here. Um, Undefeated Bahamut Chronicle. This is a, a complete collection, twelve episodes on two discs from Sente. Uh, this is more cyberpunk stuff. Uh, the uh, Prince versus Princess showdown in this uh, kind of is part of settling up the Arcadia Empire. And then lastly, Gotcha Man 2. Gotcha Man, uh, complete collection from Sente. Classic uh, anime that was uh, adapted here at a certain point. I think it was Battle for the Planets is what Gotcha Man was turned into here. This is 52 episodes in the original Gotcha Man uh, 2 series. And uh, most of this has never been seen here. And it's uh, it's uh, it's really great, you know, Japanese anime superhero stuff. It's like sci-fi superhero. It's great. It's really a lot of fun. And this is uh, from the '80s, I believe. This was originally uh, put together. So, uh, in any case, Gotcha Man Two. Good animation, Sweet. good storytelling, a lot of fun. All right, um, Mark. Next, let's we, we so let's go back to some of these docs. A terrific um, doc about uh, Toshiro Mifune. Yeah. Come on, he's the best. This is uh, Mifune, The Last Samurai, narrated by Keanu Reeves, who is probably um, uh, the person I would least want to narrate a documentary, but somehow they made his voice sound... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Toshiro is awesome. Anyway, uh, Toshiro Mifune, he obviously um, he made uh, 16 films with uh, Kurosawa, including some of his great Seven Samurai and Rashomon. And, uh, yeah, he, was, uh, he is great. He... Um, he was there during like the golden age of Japanese cinema. It was all about Toshiro Mifune, and and I just love this guy. He is so cool and so handsome, and he's just like the ultimate samurai character. And uh, yeah, this is a great documentary. It was done by um, a guy who won an Oscar named Stephen Okazaki. And so uh, yeah. And by the way, um, not all of the collaborations with Kurosawa were. Samurai films, you know, he did. Oh yeah, no, he did. I mean, High and Low is one of yeah. my favorite K Kurosawa films. That's an urban some of his story best based on an American yeah. crime novel, actually. High and yeah. Low. So uh, yeah, good stuff. So if you don't know uh, Toshiro Mifune, or even if you do, I would definitely check out uh, The Last Samurai. Yeah. Uh, a couple of uh, the most acclaimed docs from last year. I am not your Negro was uh, Oscar nominated. I thought should have probably won was, but you did know, not can win. Can I say something? Yeah. Did you oh, not like this? I, obviously, I'm I'm sympathetic to its message, but yeah. I felt like it felt like a it felt muddled to me. It felt like it wasn't well, quite making its point clearly to me. Uh, you know, for those who don't know, James Baldwin, uh, f extremely legendary and famous civil rights leader and a great thinker, uh, more than anything, uh, sort of was friends with Malcolm X and with Martin Luther King. Br sort of bridged f the philosophical divide, and the the televised interviews with James Baldwin are really extraordinary. I mean, his discussions of race and the problems of race at the time, they go to a place that others would not and could not, and uh, extremely fascinating philosophical dissection of a lot of these problems, and uh, a, a wonderful thinker. Um, his language is what narrates the film, Samuel Jackson reading a lot of his words, but then also his own words in his own recordings at other parts of the film. Uh, it is, it is a, it's more of a, a sort of a biographical essay. Now, what it doesn't do is it doesn't get into the fact that James Baldwin was also gay, um, which is a huge part of who he was. That bothered it, me a little bit. It bothered me initially, but I kind of grew to accept it because I thought, well, if you're going to make a... It's essentially the focus here is civil rights. And if you get into the, the issue of his sexuality, then you're opening up a whole new documentary. You sort of can't cross those two things together. And if you make mention of it, 
then you're you're begging a whole lot of questions that this doc doesn't have the time or the latitude to to get into. So I mean, it's almost a no win scenario. So, um, but what it does do, I think it does extremely well. And uh, it, you know, directed by Raoul Peck, who does a great job. Written by James Baldwin, I think it's a terrific film. I really do. Um, it's real worth watching in any case. Oh yes, yeah. If, if people who are not familiar with James Baldwin will definitely seminal figure get a very strong sense of who he was, what he believed in, based on this yeah. film. And then also one of the most acclaimed docs of last year is uh, director Otto Bell's The Eagle Huntress, which uh, is probably my f- overall favorite doc of the uh, of the year. Eagle Huntress is amazing. The photography alone is amazing. They basically they go to the Mongolian part of Kazakhstan because you know Mongolia. The Mongolian people don't just live in Mongolia. There's a part of China that's Mongolian and. You know, the, the, the Mongolian people, ethnically and tribally, sort of span a lot of different countries uh, other than Mongolia. So this is in Mongolian Kazakhstan. And um, there's an ancient tradition there where, you know, you, you use eagles to hunt. You go and you, if you're an eagle hunter, you capture an eagle when you're very young and your father or your grandfather or your forebears who've for hundreds of years have mastered this, you know, you capture a wild eagle and then you train that eagle and that eagle becomes loyal to you. And then when the winter comes around, you go out in the snow and you hunt rodents and foxes and whatever else with that eagle. And that eagle will catch your prey and you use the fur and the meat. I mean, they, you know, for hundreds of years, this is how these people have lived and it's how they still live. But it's always men. This is about a girl who decides, I want to be an eagle huntress. And her dad is supportive and her family is supportive and her grandfather is supportive. But all the old elders, not so supportive. Women aren't supposed to hunt with eagles. And, um, you know, of course, there's an eagle hunting competition that you go to, and you got to train your eagle to do this and that and the other thing. Anyway, all of that is about this 13-year-old girl who has decided she is going to do what men, uh, previously only men, were supposed to do. This brought me to tears. It really did. And maybe it's the father-daughter thing. Maybe I just, I, I, you know, I, I project myself into all of that. But uh, it brought me to tears. And the fact that they go to this in the middle of nowhere place, to well, tell this incredible story. Well, that's the thing. When I was watching it, and it, it, the documentary is terrific, when I was watching, I was thinking to myself, how do they find these stories? They can't, they went to just the deepest, darkest <laughs> corner of nowhere to find this incredible story. Who I found don't even this know how, story? Yeah, I don't know. Who and found these people? How, how, how did that story get back to some know. some goat farmer who then got it back to some store but, owner who then got it back to some so whoever, to a and, some filmmaker? And, and they're like attaching GoPros to the eagles at some points. I mean, there are moments where you go... Wait a minute, I'm my I'm on the head of the eagle. I'm flying. It's kind of freaky when they when they do oh, that. Stupid eagle. It's pretty. Good. It's cool. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, it's a great film, Eagle Huntress. I just love that movie. Uh, Gary Newman, Android and La La Land. In my car. I love that song when I was a kid. That was the best one. Cars. Man. Yeah, Gary Newman, Android and La La Land. Uh, I wonder whether this. I wonder whether this was called something different until La La Land came out, <laughs> and then they changed the name. Great question. Well, anyway, this is a this is a great documentary from uh, uh, First Run Features that uh, looks at it's Gary Newman looking back on his life and um, certain handicaps and issues that he had to get past. I will not reveal them uh, specifically. Uh, his family. Uh, you know, it's 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 really uh, you're taking a, a really crucial artist who is largely forgotten in this day and age. Well, but he's, who he's is, pretty much a one-hit wonder is, is is the problem. But he's he's an influence, and they talk about that here as yes. how, despite that one-hit wonder, he has become a huge influence, and his his um, his legacy is really represented more in those who cite him as an influence and who have carried his torch. But you realize what a, what an amazing guy and what an amazing life. It's a, true. It's, a, it's a good dog. Gary Newman, uh, Android in La La Land. I love that title. And then another amazing story, uh, An American Conscience, the Reinhold Niebuhr story. Uh, are you familiar with Reinhold Niebuhr? Mark? Oh, yeah, he was Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Niebuhr's, Niebuhr's kid. kid. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I had a feeling you were going to say that. Uh, so Reinhold Niebuhr is the guy who wrote the Serenity Prayer. Okay. Oh, the, 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 uh, Bless me uh, to accept the accept things, things that I can't, I can't change, change and all change that. Yeah. The things I can't whatever. Yeah. That that thing which I love, uh, which is probably quoted more than anybody else ever. And uh, this is this gets into the man behind the quote, and uh, it's very very touching and very very moving, and a lot of amazing interviews, and they get you know academics and 
and prominent political figures and people that you just, it'll blow your mind. Uh, like a lot of these docs, this is a little too short. I think it's 60 minutes. It could probably go for another 15. You know, you could get into more stuff. But it's really interesting to, to find out who this guy was and how he kind of rose to, uh, to prominence. It's, uh, it's a good movie. His prayer is a huge in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, it is. In AA, that's what they yeah, say. Yeah, for sure. And uh, oh, here, last two. You know what? Hold on. We got, yeah. Let's do uh, just, a, just a few more docs here. Um, yeah, here, I'll do these two. Air Warriors, season one, um, is all, it's, you know, this is a Smithsonian Channel show that I really just enjoy because it, I like planes and I know a lot of pilots and uh, helicopters and planes and anything aerial and great aerial footage and seeing military guys jump into these things and, uh, and just go for broke. I, look, I've seen the right stuff too many times. What can I say? I was listening to the music on the, on the way over here, by the way. And uh, this is uh, the entire first season. It's about uh, two and a half hours worth of uh, material, and it's nicely put together. And it's a fun show, and it's one of the better things on the Smithsonian Channel. And, Mark, uh, do you have a great affection for Banksy? No, I do not. Okay. But I like this documentary, Saving Banksy. And what's interesting about, this, about the documentary is not that it is about Banksy, which is great, but it sort of it presents this interesting moral quandary it's about a um this this guy who's trying to save one of the paintings one of the one of the uh, paintings from the street artist from being destroyed and even being sold at auction and it kind of gets into this very interesting discussion about you know if you you know w if, if if you owned a, a painting you know that was worth a lot of money but the artist doesn't want it to be sold. The artist thinks it should be seen by uh -huh. the masses, or the artist thinks it should be on the on on the on on, on, a, on a brick wall for everybody to look at. The artist doesn't think it should be on somebody's wall for nobody to ever see. Yeah. You know, what if the artist doesn't want his painting sold True. and you own it? You know, should you give it up? Should you continue to own it? Should you not care what the artist thinks? So there's a lot of provocative, fascinating little um, little questions being being asked in this movie. Um, I, you know, I, I liked it almost as much as Exit Through the Gift Shop, which I liked very much. Um, so, yeah. So, I would definitely recommend, uh, whether you like Banksy or not, it still asks some very interesting questions about uh, the nature of art and ownership of art, uh, saving Banksy. And uh, just about any documentary I see these days about the Arab-Israeli conflict is so depressing to me because they, you just, you, it, it looks to be increasingly impossible to resolve. Uh, but they are all illuminating in some way, and uh, I guess there's something medicinal in that. The Ruins of Lifta, from First Run Features as well, is another one of these. Lifta is the last village, the last remaining Arab village, and it's all in ruins. It doesn't, it's not an active village, but it is the last uh, remnants of an Arab village from the 1948 Arab-Israeli War that uh, has not been just demolished and replaced with something else. So it has... Uh, uh, certain significance culturally and uh, archaeologically and sociologically for the Palestinian people. Um, but there is, you know, there are Israeli developers who want to uh, take this thing and turn it into, you know, a development. I mean, we need housing, we need people, we want to make this a beautiful place. And that proposal creates a little mini conflict. And you have certain, and there are Israelis who are on the uh, Palestinian side of this and saying, this should not happen. This is an offense, and these are our brothers and sisters. And uh, this just dives headfirst into it. It's 77 minutes long, and it is intense from beginning to end. And it is, um, it, you realize how uh, what would otherwise be just a sort of simple local development dispute really has broad and far-reaching geopolitical uh, consequences. And it's, uh, it's a tough film to watch, but it's an important film to watch, The Ruins of Lifta. I have something with broad uh, uh, geopolitical. Uh, yeah, there you go. Hi, <laughs> thank you for going. In here. my pants. <laughs> you. All right, a uh, few more films to uh, cover before we wrap this out uh, in the uh, uh, archival realm. Mark, I want to know seriously, how do you feel about Serial Mom? Because Scream Factory, the uh, division of Shout Factory, has now released a collector's edition of John Waters' Serial Mom with Kathleen Turner as the serial-killing uh, happy house wife. And uh, uh, this film really divides people, as most John Waters movies do. How do you feel about it? You know, serial mo uh, John Waters has a new book out. Uh -huh. And I think that might be part of the reason why 
if he's coming out now because yep. there's some attention being paid to him. This is probably John Waters' last Watersy film, uh-huh. I would say. It was in 1994. His heyday obviously was, you know, uh, you know, way earlier than that with Pink Flamingos and whatnot. Obviously, climaxing with Hairspray. Um, I found this thing to be a little scattershot um, and a little bit mild. I felt like he was getting a little bit older and softer in his in 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 his uh, ability to be like really outrageous. Mm-hmm. You know, so I feel like it almost feels like at times it feels like. A, a guy who's pretending to be John Waters, yeah. but isn't really isn't John Waters. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying that knowing that you loved it. This is my mother-in-law. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, she doesn't kill people, but this is my mother-in-law. And and oh, if I'm she were hear that. if she if she were here, <laughs> she would laugh, and then she would probably start trying to actually fulfill that. When you uh, the beginning of this film, when she's uh, being all uh, '50s housewifey, and then the birds are singing, and she looks out and she goes, "Hooey, hooey." It's my mother-in-law. Just want to say, and I love her dearly, but she is serial mom, and that's not me saying that. that those are her kids. Get out of here, <laughs> that's, that's her family that says she's serial mom. Yes, indeed. Um, from Olive, we got a bunch of stuff from Olive. Really, really interesting stuff uh, from Olive this week. Ophelia from 1962. Uh, if you've never now, this is this is a this is the. Um, this is a really interesting merging of talents. Uh, Claude Chabrol directed this. This might be the first Claude Chabrol film on Blu-ray that I didn't do a commentary for. I feel like I've done like twenty Claude Chabrol commentaries over the year, over the years. Um, this is this is Claude Chabrol working with material inspired by Shakespeare, and so you get one of those really interesting crossovers, like you do oftentimes with Kurosawa, but in a in a much different way. It's still very very Chabrolian, and it's moody and uh, the the psychology of these characters and the way that it sort of imports Shakespearean archetypes into a contemporary situation is super, super interesting and creative, and it is some of uh, Chabrol's most interesting stuff. Um, the, the, the photography by uh, Jean Rabier is just staggering. It is staggeringly beautiful and looks so good on Blu-ray. Uh, and uh, it is one of the most... Uh, it is one of the most interesting Chabrol thrillers because you because he's clearly aware of it, that he's working from uh, it, it probably like uh, Torment, L'Enfer, where he's working with material that was originally part, you know, like the the previous screenplay by um, what's his yeah uh, um, Wages of Fear, Clouseau, Clouseau, yes. So he's working with a screenplay by Clouseau, so he pays homage to that, and he's very aware of the fact, and he doesn't overly chabrol it. Same thing here. It's very much him, but it's also very much Shakespearean, and he's clearly aware of his, his resources and his sources, and he, you know, he sort of melds himself into it in a very interesting way. It's a great film. It's a really terrific film. Uh, then there's also uh, Claude Chabrol, Jean-Luc Godard, Ugo Gregoretti, and Hiromichi Horikawa. <laughs> collaborating mm-hmm. in one of those really cool kind of uh, anthology efforts that were such a big deal in the in the 1960s in particular. Uh, this is probably best described as, it is, it is anthological, but it is also a little bit more like Babel, except it deals specifically with the global nature of, of uh, swindles and cons, and uh, it's a really interesting film, amazing cast. Uh, Gene Seberg, Catherine Deneuve, uh, Ken Mitsuda, great cinematography by some of the best cinematographers who've ever lived, including Raul Kutar, Jean Rabier, we just mentioned, and uh, Asakazu uh, Nakai. Really uh, fascinating film, the world's most beautiful swindlers. Uh, long forgotten, but very interesting. And then a bunch of the film, a bunch of uh, Valerian Borachik uh, releases. Valerian Borachik, you know, the, the the beast director. He just really a uh, really out there and a very aggressive director whose work is not quite that well-known, kind of exploitation kind of artsy, sits in a really strange place in the 1960s. Uh, it's just nobody like him. And we get uh, Goto, Isle of Love, which might be his actual best film, the most interesting film artistically that he ever made, uh, shot in black and white and really very haunting and creepy. Uh, and and not very uh, it, it dates well it ages very very well 
Uh, we also have Blanche uh, with Ligia Branice. And uh, this is a, a medieval French tale. Uh, it takes place in the, uh, the household of a, uh, a baron. And it's uh, very, very dark and, uh, and kind of gets inside your, your nerves. Beautiful photography as well. This is in color. This is from 1971. He's moving kind of more into a much more modernistic uh, style. And then there is a theater of Mr. and Mrs. Cabal. I'm sort of less enthused by this. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of this is he's dabbling in animation, and it's really very dated animation. Um, I, I don't. It doesn't really work for me. I, it's kind of a you know it's a bit of a more an experiment. It's very avant-garde animation. If you if you you know it's worth checking out if you're a fan of his, and then lastly uh, the uh, the short films collection Valerian Borachik uh, short films, which includes stuff like uh, the astronauts and angels games and the phonograph, and uh, this is interesting only if you already know what you're getting into. A lot of this is also very very experimental. There's some animation here as well, which kind of um, uh, sets the the you know the the table for the uh, theater of Mr. and Mrs. Cabal. Um, and uh, that's about it. So that's uh, Valerian Borachik. And that's what we have from Olive this month. I like Olive. I like uh, watching their films. I like eating their delicious green Mediterranean uh, fruits. Mark, we're going to talk about the last four here, um, which are from the Warner Archive collection. And uh, I've, I've got some mixed feelings about some of these films, so I'm going to let you kind of balance me out here. Um, Ride the High Country with Randolph Scott and Joel McRae is considered one of the all-time great uh, westerns of its genre. Randolph Scott and Joel McRae, obviously longtime staples of the western genre. Um, uh, Sam Peckinpah directed this, and uh, I I don't think that this is the best Peckinpah film. I think it kind of it's Peckinpah sort of trying to do to step into somebody else's shoes and trying to make somebody else's kind of western. It's not. It doesn't feel like a Peck and Paw Western so much to me. Uh, do you have any great opinion about Ride the High Country? Um, I like Ride the High Country. It is definitely not Peck and Paw's best film. I mean, if, if you were to think of something like, who, what's the quintessential Peck and Paw film, you would not think it's Ride the High Country. No, it's a Wild Bunch. Wild yeah. Bunch is a quintessential yeah. Peck and Paw. Yeah. That's it. And this doesn't, and maybe that's just because I'm holding him to too high of a standard. I mean, uh, you know, you, this can't be. This is 1962. He's, he's making this sort of in the, in the moment of when Westerns are a very particular thing. But it doesn't, it still feels like he's 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 copying somebody else's style, and I I, I a lot of people love this movie. Uh, it's it's a beautiful Blu-ray, but I just don't um, I don't really respond to it so much, and I don't even it's not even my favorite Randolph Scott film. Uh, in any case, uh, it has some interesting special features. Um, a featurette called a Justified Life: Sam Peckinpah and the High Country, which is good, and then there's a, a commentary with uh, Peckinpah. Biographers uh, Nick Redman, Paul Sidor, uh, Garner Simmons, and David Weddle. Uh, Nick Redman, of course, we should also point out, is one of the Twilight Time principals. Really, really smart guy. Uh, and then uh, Spencer's Mountain, Henry Fonda, Maureen O'Hara, Delmer Dave's movie. I'm not a big fan of Delmer Dave's either. This is beautiful to look at. Um, the the only thing that I think really makes this interesting is wonderful music by Max Steiner, and it is uh, it has kind of a uh, a kinship with the Waltons because it's it's based on the memoirs of Earl Hamner as well. So um, you know if if you accept that this sort of has a lineage that goes to the the Waltons as a TV series, then I guess there's something interesting in it. But otherwise, it just feels like a kind of a routine Delmer Dave's movie to me. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, I have not. Okay. Do I have no and then as long as we're on the subject of uh, Henry Fonda, Henry Fonda and Glenn Ford in The Rounders, um, which is okay. Uh, they are better than the movie, directed by Burt Kennedy. This is from 1964. Um, you know, it's kind of a, it's a star vehicle with two guys who really made a, a go of westerns, and uh, they're just kind of going through the motions here. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a particularly great film, but it's, uh, it's fun to watch those two stars. And then you have something there. This is an odd little movie, 36 Hours. It's a little like, um, imagine like, I don't know, Manchurian Candidate or Seconds or The Twilight Zone. It's got that, it's got a weird little funky thing going on. It's with James Garner, and um, he plays a, uh, it's during World War II, 
and he has information about the, um, the invasion of Normandy. So the Germans capture him, they drug him, and they make him believe that that the war has been over for six years. And they're asking him about the invasion of Normandy. That it's going to happen in real life. But they have oh, convinced him through drugs that the war has been over actually for six years. So when they ask him about it, he's deciding, should you do it? Is there something wrong? Am I crazy? Should I get the information? But the war is over. But is it really over? So it's got that weird, like, second Manchurian candidate, Twilight Zone thing going on. So it's definitely kind of an interesting uh, little movie. It's with um, Eva Marie Saint plays a um, plays a nurse in it. And uh, I would call this sort of like a uh, war film noir. Nice. And, uh, so I think 36 Hours is... It's, it's, it's this big, gigantic con game against James Garner in the middle of the war. Awesome. So I thought it was kind of cool. All right. Well, that is it. James Garner, Eva Marie Saint, 36 Hours, Warner Archive Collection. All right, Mark. We'll be, uh, you know what? Next week, we may not be back next week. What? Uh, it's Mother's Day next week. Aw, so, mommies. Uh, so it is uh, it is unforeseen what next week will bring. So there may not be a show next week. So just so everybody knows. But uh, if there isn't, we will be back the following week. We will let everybody know on the Facebook page. If you need to get to us, gods at digigods.com. 